Hi, welcome back to our study of Revelation. It's great to be with you all again. Today we begin chapter 10, and I wish I could tell you that this is going to be an easy chapter, easy to understand and straightforward to interpret. I wish I could tell you that, but I can't. Revelation 10 is another chapter of the book full of mysteries. In fact, the word mystery occurs in this chapter in the phrase, the mystery of God. We're going to look at that phrase closely a little bit later. As always, we're gonna need all the help from God we can get. So let's pray and then we'll get started. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for all of the gifts you bring us, for mercies that are new every morning for all of the material and all of the spiritual gifts that enrich our lives. We praise you in this moment, Lord God, for the gift of your holy word. We praise you for the gift of the book of Revelation, Lord God. So many things in there we just can't understand, but so much that touches our hearts, lifts us up and encourages us. As we spend some time in your word again, we pray the gift of your Holy Spirit in rich measure. Teach us what you would have us know Help us to believe what you teach us and to live what we believe. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. Let's go straight to God's word. Look at Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. So many images in this passage that we recognize. So far in our study of Revelation, we've come across the word angel or angels 32 times, including this mention of it. That's an average of three times per chapter, which is a lot. No other book in the Bible comes even close to mentioning angels as often as Revelation. We've spoken about angels often. The word angel means messenger. John used the word angel in Revelation to refer to the pastors of the seven churches of the Roman province of Asia Minor. Most of the time, however, John used the word angel to refer to heavenly beings. We first come across the word angel in Revelation chapter one, verse one, at the very beginning of the book, where we read that this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. And we get to share in it because it was made known to John by an angel sent from heaven. The angel we read about at the beginning of chapter 10 is described as a mighty angel. The angel was filled with the power of God, the kind of power that is so great that it can overwhelm whatever stands in its way. But this angel used his God-given power not to overwhelm, but to protect and to serve at God's bidding. John used the word mighty close to the end of his first epistle, where he writes that whatever belongs to God overcomes the world, and the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. The word mighty has a connotation of military engagement, a mighty army of conquering. One time Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And we confess that God is almighty. There is nothing he cannot do. The angel at the beginning of chapter 10 is described in this way. Familiar images are included in John's description of this angel. The angel was wrapped in a cloud. We've spoken before about how a cloud is a euphemism in the Bible for the glory of God. God led his people, Israel, through the wilderness during the day by a pillar of cloud. At his transfiguration, Jesus and the disciples were in a cloud. When he ascended into heaven, a cloud enveloped and covered Jesus. The Hebrew word for cloud is Shekinah, and it is synonymous with the glory of God. This angel was filled with the power of God, and he was wrapped in the glory of God. There was a rainbow over his head. The first mention of a rainbow in the Bible is in the account of the great flood. After the flood, God placed a rainbow in the sky to confirm his promise to never destroy the earth with a flood ever again. 
The rainbow recalls all the promises of God, including the promises that Jesus made. And the angel's face was like the sun. When we read about the transfiguration of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, we're told that his face shone like the sun. He was enveloped in his eternal glory in that moment. In the Old Testament, in the account of the time when Moses was given a brief glimpse of the glory of God on Mount Sinai, we're told that the face of Moses shone like the sun for days after, and he had to wear a veil over his face to hide its brilliance from the people because they were afraid to look at him. The angel was filled with the power of God, he was wrapped in the glory of God, and he radiated the majesty of God. And the angel's legs were like pillars of fire. Nothing in Revelation or anywhere else in the Bible helps us to understand what this image is supposed to mean. So far in our study of Revelation, we've come across the word fire nine separate times. In chapter one, and again in chapter two, John wrote that the one who was delivering his vision to him had eyes like flames of fire. In chapter two, in the return address of the letter to Thyatira, John comes right out and writes, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. The angel in chapter 10 had legs that were like pillars of fire. The Bible regularly speaks about the purifying power of fire. Perhaps there is some of that going on in this bit of information. Next, we're told that the angel had a scroll in his hand. Let's go back to God's word. Look at Revelation chapter 10, verses two to four. He had a little scroll open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded and when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. We've come across the image of a scroll before. Information was recorded on scrolls in the ancient world. Our word Bible comes from the Greek word biblios, which means books or scrolls. And the Greek word translated little scroll in this passage is biblidarion. We can hear the word Bible in the first part of that word, biblidarion. God's word was written on scrolls. One Sabbath, Jesus was in his hometown of Nazareth and he worshiped at the synagogue, the local synagogue. And because he was there, he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah to read from, and he read a passage from Isaiah 61, where it says that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the Messiah. After reading that passage, Jesus rolled up the scroll, the Gospels tell us, and announced to the congregation, today, these words have been fulfilled in your hearing. Scrolls were common in the ancient world. Unlike the earlier scroll we read about, the one sealed with seven seals, this scroll is described as a little scroll. Nothing in Revelation identifies why it was described this way. The earlier scroll we read about, we were told was written on both sides, a detail that appears to be telling us that it was full of information, so much information that every square inch of space was covered. Perhaps we're told that this was a little scroll as a way of telling us that it didn't contain as much information. There's no way for us to know for sure. The angel held a little scroll in his hand and that angel was absolutely enormous. His right foot was on the sea and his left foot was on the land. Again, nothing in the Bible helps us to understand how to interpret this bit of information specifically. One possibility is that it can mean possession or ownership or control. Standing on a particular piece of property 
sometimes signifies ownership. Perhaps what this bit of information is telling us is that the angel had control over both sea and land. And the angel called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. Another image of power and authority. The lion is the king of beasts. When he called out, seven thunders sounded. We've come across the number seven lots of times, and we've come across the image of thunder before too. All we can do is guess, but it appears to make sense that the image of thunders is a symbol for the authoritative word of God. And seven thunders might be like the perfect authority of God's word. There's a passage in John chapter 12 that connects God's word with thunder. Look at John chapter 12, John 12, verses 27 to 29. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus was in the last week of his life. His triumphant procession into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday was already a memory. And the Savior was struggling with everything that he knew was still coming. So he prayed, and God answered his prayer from heaven. People who were close to Jesus at that moment heard the noise from heaven. Some people said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to Jesus. There can be no doubt that John was present at that event. John was the beloved disciple of Jesus. He was closer to Jesus than any of the other 12. John was familiar with thunder and angels and voices from heaven. In the last week of the Savior's life, what some people labeled thunder, John labeled as a voice from heaven. In our passage from Revelation in chapter 10, John tells us that he heard seven thunders, and he was about to write what the thunders revealed, but a voice from heaven told him to seal up what the thunders had said and not to write it down. Before John could do anything at all, however, his vision took another turn. Let's go back to Revelation 10. Look at Revelation 10, 5 to 7. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. I think this part of John's vision makes us wonder who in the world the angel was in chapter 10. He was standing on the sea and on the land. Information that appears to tell us he had control of the sea and the land. Then we read that the angel raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever that there would be no delay. This doesn't sound at all like some ordinary angel. It sounds more like the Son of God himself, standing up to his Father in heaven to appeal for the mystery of God to be revealed. There's a fascinating episode in the narrative about Abraham. It's in Genesis chapter 18. The chapter begins by telling us these words, and this is a quote. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent one day, unquote. 
The story goes on to tell us that Abraham had three visitors that day, and the visitors are described sometimes as men and sometimes as angels. And there's a mystery about one of Abraham's visitors because we're told at the very beginning that the Lord appeared to Abraham. Might one of Abraham's three visitors have been the Son of God? It's entirely possible. And scholars, Bible scholars, wonder all the time what it might mean if it was the Son of God. And it's possible, as evidenced by this experience in Abraham's narrative, that sometimes the Son of God is described as an angel. The angel in chapter 10 of Revelation dared to raise his hand to heaven and swear by God, the one who lives forever and ever and who created all things. He dared to raise his hand to heaven and swear by God that there would be no more delay. The information revealed by the seven thunders would not be concealed any longer. It would be fulfilled. The angel basically stood up to God not the kind of thing that any old angel would try to do. Certainly not the kind of thing that any old human being might try to do. It's a mystery. From the little that we know about how Satan became Satan, we know that he stood up to God and he was cast out of heaven. Lucifer became Satan. There would be no more delay, the angel swore. In the days of the trumpet call sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. There is so much information going on in this single verse. No more delay. The book of Revelation begins by telling us that it speaks about things that must soon take place. We want so much to know the schedule God has set in place. What does no more delay mean? What does soon mean? But only God knows the details of the end of the world. In chapter 9, we read that God had appointed angels to do their work at the precise hour, day, month, and year he had set. Hour, day, month, and year. God has the details worked out. God knows the schedule. We don't. All we know is that there will be no more delay. And that whatever God has planned is coming soon. Whatever soon means. In the days of the trumpet call, these words sound like what the Bible tells us about the end of the world. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will be the first to rise. There's that connection again between Jesus and an angel, this time the voice of an archangel. Jesus, the Lord himself, will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. In the days of the trumpet call, we have in the passage we are studying, it sounds like it's talking about the second coming of Jesus. In the days of the trumpet call, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. The phrase mystery of God is fascinating. It appears a number of times in scripture, but not even once is there anything to explain exactly what the phrase means it appears to refer to more than one thing. Look at Romans chapter 16, 
verses 25 to 27. Now to him who was able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. We find these words at the close of Paul's letter to the Romans. As he bids the believers there farewell, he refers to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ as the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages, but now disclosed to all nations through the prophetic writings to bring about the obedience of faith. Paul makes it sound as if the mystery of God had already been revealed. It was revealed in the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul called the preaching of Jesus and the salvation of the Gentiles the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages. One possibility is that the term mystery of God refers to the preaching of Jesus Christ which you and I have heard. Another possibility is that it refers to the welcome of non-Jews into the kingdom of God, the welcome of the Gentiles. We are Gentiles. At the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul labeled the gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, the secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages. We don't find the word mystery in that passage, but it's kind of there, the secret and hidden wisdom of God. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes about the mystery of God's will, which he set forth in Christ. Look at what St. Paul wrote to the believers in the first of the seven churches of Revelation about his knowledge of the mystery of God. Look at Ephesians chapter three, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In this passage, as in the Revelation passage, Paul acknowledges that the mystery of Christ was not made known to people in the generations before Jesus. And it was revealed to them by his holy apostles and prophets through the Spirit, in the person of Jesus. Paul goes on to declare that the mystery is that the Gentiles are as much people of God as the Jews were because they are partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And later in this passage, Paul wrote that the mystery was hidden for all ages in God who created all things. Paul repeats this same theme three times in his letter to the Colossians. He wrote about how great the riches were among the Gentiles of the glory of the mystery in Christ. Then, speaking about the believers in Laodicea, another of the seven churches of Revelation, Paul wrote about his prayers for the believers there to be reassured by their knowledge and understanding of God's mystery. Paul wrote that the believers in Laodicea knew and understood God's mystery. And in a third mention of the mystery of God in the book of Colossians, Paul simply connected the word, the message he preached, with the mystery of Christ. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul includes what some Bible scholars suspect may have been a kind of creedal formula 
or confession of faith in the ancient church. Look at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The phrase, mystery of godliness, is hard to translate. Most translations choose these words, mystery of godliness. The difficulty is in that word godliness. Some translations choose to interpret it this way, the secret of our religion. Other translations, hidden truth. Another translation, mystery of piety. Another, reverence for God. The message, one of the most modern translations of the Bible offers this. The words will be on your screen. This Christian life is a great mystery, far exceeding our understanding. But some things are clear enough. He appeared in a human body, was proved right by the invisible spirit, was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among all kinds of peoples, believed in all over the world, taken up into heavenly glory. Like so many other parts of Revelation, this part also mystifies us. The mystery mystifies us. It challenges us to come up with definitive interpretation. My personal suspicion is that the phrase mystery of God refers to the person and work of Jesus in all its parts, which is a mystery for so many reasons. But perhaps the most important reason, because we believe that what Jesus did all by himself is sufficient to pay for the sins of the whole world and to secure for all who believe in him eternal life and salvation. One man is the savior of the whole world. That's a mystery. And part of the mystery has to do with the schedule that God followed. Why did he send his son when he sent his son? Why not before, why not later? While it doesn't include the word mystery, there's a passage in 1 Peter that speaks to all this, I think. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, just a few pages before Revelation. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The prophets who recorded the prophecies about the Messiah. When Isaiah wrote the words, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child, to us a son is born, to us a son is given, and his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When David wrote in Psalm 22, they have pierced my hands and feet. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As they wrote these words, as the prophets wrote the prophecies about the Messiah, they desperately wanted to understand what in the world they were writing about. But it was never revealed to them. It remained a mystery 
until Jesus Christ came into our world. The grace God lavishes on us through the person of Jesus Christ, his suffering and subsequent glories, everything about Jesus. The Old Testament prophets who delivered the prophecies about the Messiah, they desperately wanted to know and to understand what in the world they were writing about. They searched and inquired carefully, pleading to understand. But it remained a mystery to them because it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves. It was not about them, but they were serving us. All the people to whom the good news of the gospel has been preached. We who know the good news of God's love for us in Jesus Christ are privileged to know the mystery of God. We know things into which angels long to look. For the angels, it is still a mystery. I believe the phrase mystery of God applies to everything related to Jesus Christ, including his second coming and all the glory that will be displayed in him at that time. Paul wrote to the Philippians that a time is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That moment, I believe, the moment when all creation will know beyond the shadow of any doubt and with no confusion whatsoever that Jesus is Lord is the moment John is referring to in this passage. The moment when the mystery of God will be fulfilled. This is the moment the prophet spoke about. This is the moment the apostles preached about. This is the moment so many wondered about and tried so hard to understand. The moment fulfilled for us. We're not yet finished with the little scroll that was in the angel's hand, and we need to spend a little more time in it. We'll do that next time. For now, I believe it's comforting to know that at least part of the mystery of God has been fulfilled. The Son of God came into our world. He took on human flesh, our nature. He is God with us. He was seen by angels, he was preached among the nations, he was believed on in the world, he was taken up into glory. He died to pay for the sins of the whole world and came back to life again to prove that we are one with God. We are the children of God. We are no longer his enemies. So much mystery. The love of God is a mystery because it is so wide and high and deep and long beyond our ability to measure or comprehend. And the grace of God is a mystery because it means we don't get what our sins deserve and we get what we don't deserve, what is given to us only by grace. And the goodness of God is a mystery because it sounds too good to be true. And the mercy of God is a mystery because we could never be as merciful as he is. There is so much mystery, but there is also so much revelation. We know the only true God and his son, Jesus Christ, the only savior. We know and believe. And when you think about that, that's a mystery too. Why do we believe? Why doesn't everybody believe? Why is it so hard for some of the people we know and love to believe? Why do we believe? There is so much mystery. Our God is way too great 
to be understood in every way by his creatures. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for everything that we do know and we do understand and we believe. We praise you for revealing yourself to us, for granting us to know you, the only true God, and your Son, Jesus, the only Savior. We praise you, Father, for creating faith in us, and we pray for all those who do not believe that you would do the same for them. We pray that you would call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify all people as you have done those things for us. Wherever we are, whatever is going on in our lives, help us always to hear your voice, listen to your word, follow you, and love you. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. See you next time. Stay well. God be with you.